G'day. Welcome to Lunch Money. You are live here. It's midday uh, on the 25th of June. Uh, I am talking to you from uh, one of the one of the dastardly LGAs in Sydney that's just been locked down. I'm not wearing a mask because I'm outside. Um, and what's a little bit alarming for me is that uh, my laptop camera, I think, takes about 10 years off my age. So don't be alarmed. Uh, I haven't had any traumatic events. It's just that I'm now talking to you on my iPad and uh, I now look uh, about every bit as bad as I normally do. Um, welcome to Lunch Money. We are your online and social media home for special situations, workouts and capital raising professionals. My name is Nick Samios. I am the fund manager and director here at Hermes Capital and I am your Lunch Money host. So uh, a very warm welcome to you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I, being outside, I'm a little bit thrown off my usual shtick, so what do I normally do? I normally say, do remember to uh, share, like, or subscribe to our, our humble podcast, uh, whatever you, wherever you're watching us on. Um, if you go into Apple, uh, Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating, yeah, I'd really appreciate that. That'd be awesome. Um, now, the other thing I would say to you is, is that if you ask us an online question, uh, and I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, there you go. If you ask us an online question, then uh, we will send you one of these lunch money mugs. Uh, they're special edition, very limited. In fact, we only get them made in small batches. We ran out, but we've had a special, uh, uh, special small batch made up just for you today if you ask us a question. Uh, now, what I'll ask my producer to do is to throw any questions that we get on the screen because uh, I'm not on my laptop and I can't see them, so uh, she will throw them up as we get to them. Well, uh, here we are. Uh, Sydney's going into a lockdown, and I don't really want to make too much of a big deal about it because our friends in, in Melbourne and Victoria have had to endure a lot more of this sort of stuff than we, than we have. Uh, but it does make me wonder, you know, it's, it's time to, to revisit a couple of topics, in particular uh, the topic of resilience, uh, burnout, staying motivated, uh, managing your teams remotely, selling remotely, um, and influencing remotely. How do we how do we do all of those things? How do we stay motivated, avoid the burnout, and manage people uh, remotely? Well, I thought that I would ask one of uh, one of our most popular guests uh, to come back uh, and to talk about these things. And, and that popular guest is Arabella McPherson. Here she comes. Hi, Nick. Hey, how are you going, Arabella? <laughs> You look extremely young today. I don't know what it uh, is, but you look. Uh, 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 I look almost like the sexagenarian that I am, almost am. Now, listen, you're you're in Byron Bay. You still there? Yeah, oh, I oh, am sorry. still. I, mean, I am. No, no, no. Go right ahead. Yes. I'm okay. still in Byron Bay, and yep. uh, I do I do come to Sydney quite regularly. I was supposed to be coming on Wednesday for my mentor's funeral, actually. Uh. So. But that's not happening. That's all being live streamed. So we'll see what happens there. Okay. But yes, sunny Byron Bay. Wow! And it's been uh, it's it's been about a year since we last spoke. And we did a we did a um, a podcast. We focused on resilience, and we had yourself and we had Ian Hyman as well, who um, does a lot in charity, uh, and he he deals a lot with people that. Uh, have got you know special spe special situations at home with uh, family with special needs and all the sort of stress that that brings. And we were talking at that time about you know we're in the middle of the pandemic and lockdown and all that sort of stuff. And and so we were talking a lot about resilience. So, firstly, what 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 have you been doing the last twelve months? And what's <laughs> has, has your has your business morphed or what what are you doing differently? What have you what's, mm. what have you been up to? That's a good question. Uh, so, Nick, a lot of what our company does is support companies who are in lockdown or who are around Australia or internationally through this transition. And I think what has been very clear is that uh, people are, <laughs> the transition is just keeps on morphing, as you said. I mean, Sydney's just gone back down into lockdown. But talking to clients overseas, they're experiencing a lot of trauma. And that's on top of having to meet their KPIs and get their objectives and finish the end well of the year well with their end of financial year wrap-ups. So it's about helping people stay connected, staying motivated, which is becoming increasingly difficult, especially when people are missing out on their holidays like right now and not having that opportunity to 
refresh, but still need to get their objectives. And so, so you know, what your business was, say, before we went into well, before we went into this whole situation. I mean, you were very much leadership going into boardrooms, and I, I guess particularly, as I recall, you were dealing with people who particularly had been promoted, or, or all of a sudden they were in leadership roles. Am I getting that right? Mm-hmm. And they suddenly needed to upskill. Yeah, so I work with several different areas, but I was working mainly with CEOs, executives and senior leadership teams. So the people who are setting the culture from the top down and we're looking at advanced influencing skills. So influence, negotiation, conflict resolution, pitching, presenting and advanced communication. So that was mainly what we were looking at in 2019, towards the end of 2019, I decided to move my business online, which... Uh, my clients didn't like so much <laughs> and I offered them other coaches who were still doing a lot of face-to-face work and uh, but they all came back which was great and so then we started 2020 with a full cohort and of course the pandemic happened so we were we were already online and what we have been doing because I, I co-wrote the communication section of Macquarie Uni's global online MBA in 2019 for the first half I was working alongside learning technologists on how to get people trained in the skills that they needed to be and how to make that information stick. Because what I had found and why I went online was I found that running a one-day workshop had certain benefits. It built morale, brought people together. But in terms of them learning what they needed to learn, it didn't have such a great... uh, the, The proof was not there. Research internationally shows that blended learning is by far the most effective way to teach people. So where you have a live element and where you have an online element or uh, an element where they can go back and watch videos or look at resources and revise content that way. So I've been coaching now almost 15 years and I've been extremely frustrated at working with a team and then not seeing them again or uh, having a limited amount of uh exposure to them or an effect on the way that they change behavior whereas now we're seeing incredible results Uh, for example one company that you know extremely well uh, we've been working with last year and the ceo of one department said why are our meetings so much better (laughs) they're just much more on point people are prepared they're asking excellent questions i feel convinced by what they're saying and they said well half of our people have gone through influential conversations program with arabella he said put everyone else through So I think what they're seeing is that meetings, conversations, relationships are becoming far more effective with this blended learning. Well, okay. Well, so so that's interesting. I mean, the the change in technology is one thing. um, Like Zoom Zoom meetings or even we're we're using a StreamYard platform here, but these platforms have become a lot more reliable now. I mean, I've been using GoToMeeting for years and nothing against GoToMeeting. But, you know, you always had that thing about, can you hear me? Is everybody there? And, you, know, you still have that. <laughs> you know, that hasn't um, changed. You know, all, all of that sort of stuff. But it, but it has got better. The, te- the technology certainly yeah. got better. But, you know, I, I want to ask you a little bit of a left field question. I, I, and, and we have got some points that we're going to go through methodically. But I'm going to ask you something that, that we hadn't talked about. What What is charisma? The reason I ask that question, uh-huh. right, is that, you know, some people, now I've been in a, in a room with, with you, right, and, and mm. you know, some people have a presence. You've got a presence in, in the room mm. and, uh, you know, so, so what is charisma and how does that, and then how do we translate that into this electronic medium? I love that question. and. I love it because it's a question that I ask myself as well. How do you teach charisma or how do you help someone step into their best self and be able to command a room or get people's attention? And it comes down to a couple of things. And firstly is your mindset. I I remember, um, this is really embarrassing. Can I share this (laughs) online, Nick? Uh, (laughs) I remember at school, Uh, One of my friends used to say to me, you always walk into a party and look so happy and vibrant and excited. And I I said, well, I've got a secret. And she said, what is it? And I said, I walk in thinking that everyone's in love with me. Now, I'm not suggesting that you walk into your business meetings thinking that everyone's in love with you, but I think that you have to set yourself up knowing that you are valuable and that you have uh, 
knowledge to offer or you can help people or that you've got an agenda that needs to be carried out, a bigger purpose. So when you commit inside to working on something that's bigger than yourself, then that instantly gives you a drive that isn't just about you. So that's one part. It's just getting that that mindset right and knowing why you're in the room for the first Look, in, in the first just, instance. Um, I, 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 um, I, I've always, I used to say, I'm a lot more mature these days, but I used to say there was two rules in life. Uh, rule yeah. one is deny everything. And uh, <laughs> rule two is act as if you own the place. So exactly. I guess your, yours is a little bit more of a, a, a sort of a, a more humane uh, version of that. Okay, so go, I've sort of interrupted you there. That's all right. The second part are skills. And skills are really, really important because I used to work with ad agencies in London who would be pitching for multi-million, even uh, huge, huge deals. And they had a whole process that they had to go through. And part of the process was meeting with the client and having a chemistry session. And I would meet with them after they'd had this chemistry session. Chemistry session is essentially, do we get on with the client? Or does the client get on with us? And I'd be brought in, they said, look, we just didn't connect. And I said, well, that is not okay. That is not okay that you don't connect because human behavior is so methodical. It's process driven. It's a formula. So for example, I use the process communication model, which Bill Clinton uh, is also trained in. He's a big advocate of, which is a set of skills that comes from NASA that looks at different personality styles and how we behave under pressure and how we prefer to communicate. And so as soon as someone walks in front of me, even by the lines on their face, Botox is throwing a spanner in the works, but they're even by their smile lines or their, their thinking lines or their discerning lines, I can tell how they prefer to communicate. And in that instant, I will either uh, take all, um, I'll take away my, my vocal tone, I'll just be monotone if I'm talking to someone who's very structured, especially if they've got glasses or lines across their forehead. I will take away the animation. If I see someone with smile lines, these ones, I go, hey, what's up? How are you going? So you're, you're constantly shifting and adapting to who you see. So those skills are extremely important. And Richard Branson is a great example. He's met a lot of my clients and they all love him, whether they're facts, data, structure, timing people, whether they're highly energetic, fun people, or whether they're about money, status or reward or have strong opinions, values and beliefs. He's incredibly adaptable. And that's what you want to learn is how do I adapt to the person I'm speaking to? Not that I lose myself, but what skills do I need to put in place? And if you look at words, tones, gestures, posture and facial expressions, there's a combination for each personality style that you can embody and instantly connect with that room. The third part is being present. And that's probably the most difficult one. And we've all heard of the mm word, the meditation word. Most people uh, shy away from it or don't like it. Mindfulness was a, a softer version. But it's about being able to breathe, center yourself, and then be present with the people you're with. Because when you're present, people feel it. Well, that's firstly, uh, I'd have two comments there. Firstly, I feel as though I need to start getting some, <laughs> some moisturizer uh, unless, unless I get mis misunderstood. But, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I do feel very, very self conscious now. But um, there, there, is, there, there is no doubt that, that when someone is present, you, you, you do get that feeling. Uh, and I know I have heard it said of Bill Clinton, but there are other people that we meet that we, we know that when they're talking to us, actually, a lot of politicians have it, don't they? Um, you know, you, you feel so special, even if there's a thing of remembering your name, of course, but they engage with you and it's like nothing else is going on. Uh, so I guess there's an element of that, but what? How does that? You know, how does that translate from? You know, obviously we can see each other now, but we're not in the same mm. room. You know, we mm. can't we can't sort of lay a handshake, or mm. um, you know, you can't see if I'm you know tapping my pen or, or whatever it might be. So how does how does what's how does that translate? That's a good question. Firstly, a quick story about Bill Clinton because he is interesting to study because he is one of the most trained communicators, regardless of your political views. And I think you'd remember Natasha Stott Despoja, who is head of the Democrats. Yes, absolutely. Do you remember her? Yes, for sure. So when Bill Clinton had his dalliance with Ms. Lewinsky, uh, he was coming out to Australia and she, and this is, I haven't, I didn't witness this, but I heard this story and I thought it was fantastic. She said, 
she was outraged at what he was doing and that he was the leader of a country and that his values weren't good. And she said, when I meet him, I'm going to tell him what I think of him because this is despicable and he's not a good person. The next day you have the plane with the stairs and then the red carpet coming up and you have John Howard, of course, our or Prime Minister, he's shaking people's hands whilst looking at the next person. He's not even looking at the person whose hand is shaking. Whereas Bill Clinton comes along, he takes N- Natasha's hand and he goes, Natasha, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and she melts. Of course, of course. And then in the media the next day, Bill Clinton's such an incredible leader. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying that we're that fickle, and yet mm. I am, um, that we do really take to people who are being present with us. When it comes to a virtual world, now uh, the stakes are higher because there are far more things to distract us, including, oh, my my chai that's getting cold or my phone that might buzz or uh, the list that I'm writing with my pen underneath. There's, there's so many things, so many more things that can distract you. And this is where uh, you have an opportunity. Uh, Part of this is when you set up a meeting or a conversation, especially if it's a regular meeting within a company, is to say, is to acknowledge it and to say, look, we've got a lot of things going on. We've got emails, we've got pop-up notifications. Can we put everything down? And instead of making this an hour-long meeting, can we make it 40 minutes? And that's only if everyone stays present and jumps in when we need to. Let's go quickly. We know what the agenda is. We've put it together. Is everyone okay with that? And what you'll find is even by acknowledging it, even if someone does look at their phone at some point, (laughs) they will feel guilty or shame, but it also means that you need to do it. So when you are in meetings, as much as possible, make sure that you are focused on the person who's speaking to you. If you're having back-to-back meetings, that has to change. You cannot translate normal operating within a company to online you can't go from back-to-back meetings in the office to back-to-back zoom it's just it's too fatiguing all right look um before we sort of then move on to just uh, the little talking points that we've got here you know just based on what you're saying there you know we're talking about you know bill clinton and body language uh, i do i do know that another little anecdotal story there jody rich I don't know if you know Jody Rich. He had a company called Imagineering, and they had another company called OneTel. But apparently, he used to turn up at meetings with um, paddle pops, and he knew <laughs> they'd be turning up, and that people were going to be tearing shreds off him. But he'd hand out these paddle pops, and uh, it's really hard for anybody to get too angry while they're while they're munching on a paddle pop. But I'm interested. I I think I mentioned to you. I I, I listened to a podcast um, this week. And it was a podcast, it's called The Art of Manliness, but they have lots of little life skills mm. in it. And they interviewed a lady who uh, had done this thing on digital body language. Um, mm. And is that, do you sort of, is that something you turn your mind to? Or? Yeah, look, digital body language is uh, a wonderful way of <laughs> talking about simply body language. I mean, whether it's on or off the camera, it's the same. Because apart from the fact that I am right now looking straight at the camera. So when I'm listening to you, I'm looking at your face. But when I'm speaking, I look straight down the camera so that the audience is getting more of what I'm saying. Having said that, most of what you do comes across energetically, which means that if I'm tired, for example, I'll change my body language in just a moment. I'm just going to sit back. And if I'm sitting like this, then you get you get me pulling away from the screen as opposed to when I'm sitting up, I'm energised, I'm involved. So digital body language, what it really is, I mean, I come from an acting, opera singing background. That was my previous career before coaching and it was all about the body and how you interacted with people. What we know is that you want to match the people that you're speaking to as much as possible. So match them physically and vocally and repeat their exact words and phrases back to them. When you don't have their video to watch, however, it turns to two things, the vocal tone and their exact words or phrases. So what is best is to write down their exact words and phrases and repeat them back to that person. And your vocal tone needs to connect with them. For example, if they speak like this, then you want to be speaking like that, matching them 60% 
vocally and their exact words and phrases. Then there are certain things that you can do with your body to help you feel energized. Because what we know about acting, I'll give you an example. I used to work way back when, when I was training as an actress, I worked at the Opera Bar in Sydney, which is a great venue right on the water next to the opera, as you probably know. And I remember working behind the bar and they had someone from Getaway. And she was this beautiful blonde presenter. She was made up, her nails outfit was done but she looked absolutely exhausted and she said okay so what have we got and they had a whole range of cocktails lined up and they said a Singapore sling a sex on the beach and a Long Island iced tea and she said okay fine and then the director said okay we're going to go live in five four three and she said, hi, and welcome to Getaway. And today what we're seeing, <laughs> and so I was like, whoa. But what she understood is that when you are transversing a screen or a different medium, then you have to put more energy in it. It's still a conversation, but it's a heightened conversation. And right. that's why when you're on Zoom or when you're doing meetings virtually, it requires more energy. That's interesting. So firstly, you gave a great tip there, which was, um, I, well, firstly, you gave a couple of tips. Firstly, I always tell people before they before we go live on these live streams is to look at the camera because it is, it's just more engaging as, and I obviously don't need to tell you that. But the other thing that you, you just pointed out was jotting down notes uh, to, and to, 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 to read the words back because, you know, in any communication, mirroring is uh, is a way of, of uh, building trust and empathy and all the rest of it. So, so that's interesting as well. And what you're saying is you need to have more energy, you know, uh, in a in a in a screen situation than than in a in a face to face situation. So you need to bring bring more to it. For example, when I was uh, pre COVID, I was speaking at a lot of conferences, and I remember one particular day where somehow. Uh, my speaking slots had changed until they were right next to each other. And I was speaking all the way downtown Sydney near World Square at a, a hotel there to a conference of, of people in technology. And I remember I always get there early because I want to see how the audience is and how the last speaker is and what the, the mood is. And the last speaker was saying, so if you open this spreadsheet and you enter in these facts and details that will change it so that you will get these results and it was very very monotone and the audience was very calm and so when I got up I uh, I started to tell them a story but I did it in the same tone of voice and and then I took them through how to influence in conversations I finished that conference and I literally had to run down to the intercontinental near circular key to get on stage for a huge conference of uh, people women in health and this room was packed and it was as if every woman had had a bottle of champagne each because they were, oh, ha, ha. the vibe was so different. I got up and I said, how are we? It was a very different audience, similar content, but delivered completely differently. So it's all about the person you're speaking to. How do they interact? How do they prefer to communicate? Going back to what I was saying about Richard Branson and Bill Clinton, adapt to who you're speaking to. Okay, look, um let me then take that. Uh, we still haven't got to any of our talking points yet, but uh, let, me, let me just ask you. You know, in in my world, and it's not just in my business, but the, you know, the, our target audience in this in this podcast are uh, you know, they're lawyers and accountants and finance people. You know, doing some of them are doing big ticket deals. You talk about you know millions of dollars, and and you know, if it's a restructuring scenario, there's a lot of stress. And there's a lot of high stakes, you know, if it's done wrong, you know, things could go horribly wrong if it's done right, you know. And so certainly building trust is enormous. Um, now, I can't go to WA, right? I can't go anywhere right now. I mean, so you know, for me, if, I, if I've suddenly got a, a $5 million transaction over in Perth, I can assure mm. you that I can get it done. Um, but, 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 you know, I've always said, being an old school person, I've always said the most important thing for me is to get across the table from someone. Um, but, you know, what, what about in those high-stakes high situations, uh, you know, where it's just where trust is, is paramount? Great question. So there's two main things that you can look at. Firstly is trust is built through an, a number of connections with that person, whether that be face-to-face, -face, virtually, on the phone, via email. And they are... 
they are looking at the culmination of those interactions and saying, do I feel heard? Do I feel understood? Do I feel respected and accepted for who I am? And do you understand what we're doing here? So they're constantly gleaning that information from every single interaction that you have with them. What you can do that we didn't really do before because we were face-to-face is all sorts of things such as lumpy mail, send things to people. Uh, For example, I had a client who just came back from the UK who was over there visiting family uh, who's now in quarantine. So we sent sent this person a hamper. Uh, There's a a bunch of clients uh, that I wanted to connect with. Uh, There's about 10 of them that I wanted to connect with in particular. So I sent them a book recently and a card. There's lots of things that you can do outside of the norm which will reinforce that relationship, especially with high stake conversations. You want to send them things, uh, articles, podcasts, anything that's going to help build that rapport that you might do if you were you know, face-to-face or in person. So that's one part is there's a lot of things you can da- do now that we didn't we haven't done for a long time because we didn't need to, which help augment or reinforce those interactions in that relationship, showing that you care about them. The second part is having uh, expert influencing skills, understanding how the brain works and how to influence the brain. We've talked about matching, so matching people physically, vocally, 60%, repeating their exact words and phrases back to them. I, I often tell a story of when I was in London, I was working alongside a wordsmith and he uh, was from Oxford and he had brown leather um, boat shoes and blue jeans that were rolled up at the ends and a white t-shirt, Bonds t-shirt, round glasses and a brown leather satchel and he said hello Arabella how is your first how is your first week in London been and I said oh it's it's been great it's been intense but a lot of fun and he said fun and I said yeah fun <laughs> and my colleague said why do you question whether she had fun or not? Of course she's having fun. And he said, oh, no, I just repeat the last word of anyone's phrase. And it worked because I felt heard uh, by this person who was repeating my words. So matching is a major part of it. Another part is being properly prepared. So knowing, doing, and I, I say to my clients that stalking is not okay unless it is okay, Which and the only time it is okay is when you're wanting to build that relationship. So you will look at everything you can find on that person, going to their Facebook page, looking at whether they have kids or what groups they're a part of, what they listen to in terms of podcasts. You can get so much information digitally, digitally, which will help you connect with this person. Because the more that you know about this person, the more you can predict how they're going to make decisions and influence those decisions. Uh, So the more you can influence those decisions. I was very mindful to try and repeat the last couple of words. (laughs) Um, That's right. Okay. Well, that's uh, okay. That's that. And what what I'm hearing from you is, um, you know, for example, you know, if I look at services marketing 101 one of the things how do you uh deal with the fact that the service is intangible you try and tangibilize it you know by you know things that you can touch and feel so you know, you're saying that you bring an element of that uh to it and you know certainly there's nothing necessarily new about you know you, you need to know your client know your customer all that sort of stuff it is interesting what you talk about stalking because you know, i'm always mindful i don't really want to leave a footprint to see that someone that i've been looking at someone's profile um mm. All right, listen, let's, let's sort of, um, we, we are, time is beginning to get away from us and I, um, I just want to revisit uh, a subject that we talked about last time, which was, was resilience. Uh-huh. Um, now, I don't know if, if you've, I mean, Black Hawk Down may not be your kind of movie, I'm not quite sure, um, but, you know, they, they, they go through, the whole movie is this traumatic experience of, you know, people getting killed and lots of gunfire and then mm. uh, we've got this scene with Eric Banner. I'll just show you three seconds of this scene with Eric Banner. You're going back in. You're going back in. You're going back in. Yeah. You're going back he's, in. He's, he's, he's going back in. So basically he's had, it, like, it, the whole idea of, uh, you know, you th- it's the end of the movie, you know. It's the end mm. of the exercise. It's the but he's going back in. He's going back into the hellfire, back into the mm. trauma, you know. Now, here in Sydney, we've, we've had it really easy compared to our friends in Melbourne. So mm. I am not by any stretch comparing our situation to them. 
But take the Melbourne situation, you know, they, they had to go back in, back into another lockdown. So, you know, we talked whenever it was last year, I remember it was cold, um, but it was, so I think it was winter last year. Um, and it's one thing to talk about resilience, but what about when you think you've got to the end of that journey and then you've got to go back in? Yes. So <laughs> going back in, uh, interestingly, we have never had control. We've never had control. And if you look at Epictetus' work, um, who is part of the Stoic movement, he's a Greek philosopher, he said we we can only control what we can control. And I know that sounds really obvious and we all know that, but so many of us are trying to control things that are outside of our control. What the pandemic has shown us is that we, we never had control over everything around us. Sometimes you might have, before pandemic, pre-pandemic, you might have gone to a restaurant and it was closed because they'd had a fire or you were about to uh, go to a friend's place and they were sick so you couldn't go over or uh, you're going to go on holiday but there was a tornado there or something. So we've never had control. What this is showing us is that we still don't have control and it's, it's asking of us to be far more flexible, relinquishing that control. Now that's very, very difficult, especially for uh, adults who are extremely competent, who run to a schedule, who run major businesses, uh, acknowledging that they have no control is is something that can be quite scary. And when I was speaking to uh, an executive yesterday, he just said, "Look, I'm I'm so short with my family and the people I care about. Like I'm holding it together at work, but then when I'm not at work, I, he said I don't have the hour drive home. I'm suddenly with my family and my my kids and." It's all too much and I, I don't want to be that person but I am. And the first question I asked him was, are you meeting your needs? Say you had that hour drive home and now you're not having that, that break. Can you put a break in? Can you put a, an exercise bike in the garage and after you finish work, change, get that exercise, have that time to yourself, listen to music and then come upstairs what that means is there has to be a lot of negotiation within the households and not everyone's in a partnership either or in a family. So it's, for example, myself, I was living alone in Sydney uh, when the pandemic hit and for six weeks I was very, very lonely and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about a bubble or getting it together. We didn't know it was going to be six weeks, whereas I think now people understand the rhythm of, pan of the pandemic. That it's going to happen again and again and again and the more that we accept it, the more we're going to be able to run with it and keep asking ourselves the question, what? how can I meet my needs? What do I need right now? And it might need be time out. It might be uh, a chat with a friend. It might be more exercise. It might be uh, eating differently. It's just what do I need? And I spoke at a conference of nurses uh, towards the end of last year and the topic was it's selfish not to be selfish meaning that when you don't need, meet your needs, you can be aggravated, angry, frustrated, reactive, and everyone around you suffers. So it is crucial that you go, okay, what do I need right now? And you know what? If I've got back-to-back -back meetings today and I'm not feeling up to it, I'm going to have to cancel five of those or move them or change them. And the more flexible we are, the more we accept other people doing that as well. I guess uh, okay, so it's a little bit like uh, putting, making sure that you've got the uh, the, the life mask, uh, the, the face, the, what is it, the gas mask, absolutely, the oxygen mask. <laughs> uh, Maybe not the gas mask, yeah, the oxygen the gas mask. Yeah, or so, um, well, the other gas. Could be a bit, could be a bit extreme, but I, I guess uh, self maintenance. I mean, it's interesting, you know, when you're talking about stoic and uh, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it'd be very easy if if this wasn't the middle of the day. If this was, you know, in, in the evening after a few glasses of wine, you could very easily get into a very philosophical and almost spiritual discussion uh, about all of that. Um, mm. And and I guess so. What you're saying is really, it's just when you know when all the, when we thought we were out of it, we thought it was behind us. You know, we started to think about. You know all the travel again, just to revisit um, that those that those skills of uh, self maintenance and self care, and what is it you need to keep yourself topped up? It's it's basic, but I, I mean, I I went to a, a meditation retreat maybe two weeks ago. I went there kicking and screaming because I hate retreats, and and yet I know I get so much from them. And I was in a room of people who all had multi million dollar businesses, and everyone was stressed and exhausted and tired. We did 
I think, 10 meditations a day. We were just constantly being taken in and out of meditation. By the end of the four days, I I was bouncing off the walls. I was so alert and so free and light and happy. And I it just reminds you that if you're feeling stressed, close your eyes, take a nap, just stop, breathe, just take time out. Uh, it's This is not going to get... Uh, It's not going to change very quickly, unfortunately, even though vaccinations are out and all sorts of things are happening. It's it's going to be very, very slow. And we all know that. But it's it's definitely about making sure that you're giving your brain a rest. All right. Look, we are we are running down the clock and uh, I think we may have got to one or two of our talking points. Uh, I notice on my iPad that I've only got eight percent battery left. So. Uh, why don't you tell us just quickly about these? Uh, you're doing intuitive leadership, influential conversations, and presence, present with presence. So you know, these are some online courses that you're doing. Yeah, so at the moment we're running Intuitive Leadership, which is a phenomenal program which looks at how to meet your needs, how to have difficult conversation, giving and receiving feedback, coaching your staff, which is crucial if you're managing teams remotely. We've had a uh, a major request for more help with that, which is totally understandable because the managers were exhausted themselves and then they were needing to look after their employees who were requiring more from them. And so uh, a lot of the leadership program is about teaching your people to be their own leaders and to know how to ask for what they need from their managers or to put in place Um, conversations or systems that are extremely practical. For example, the coaching module looks at the seven questions you ask someone when you're coaching them. And coaching is one of, as according to the Harvard Business Review, is one of six top leadership styles that can release your own overwhelm and yet it's the least used, mostly because people don't know how to use it. So intuitive leadership is a great program we're doing. uh, Influential Conversations is an online program as well. And that definitely looks at how do you set up, what are the eight steps of an influential conversation or a meeting? How do you embed messages into the unconscious of people's uh, uh, brain? And there are 30 ways of how to overcome objections. Once you understand how to overcome objections, it becomes quite fun. You think, bring it on, bring on the objection, I'm here for it. Uh, And it's taking away that fear or the mystery of how do I convince people to do what I want them to do by the end of the conversation. It's so formulaic, it isn't funny. And then there's present with presence, which is the presenting. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, Arabella, it has been fantastic having you. Uh, I feel I feel energised myself. So, uh, <laughs> uh, bring, on, bring on these lockdowns, come what may. So thank I you, want a paddle pop. <laughs> and lactose right. free, gluten free, sugar free. Uh, it's all got a lot more complicated than what they used to be, hasn't, hasn't it? it? Hasn't it? Indeed. All right. Well, uh, look, thank you very much to uh, our live viewers, and uh, thank you very much to our, if you're listening to the podcast later on. Thank you very much, Arabella McPherson. It's been fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you for have having you me. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm impressed that despite being thrown into lockdown, you're still there, still doing what you've said you would. So congratulations. It's impressive. No. All right. Thank <laughs> you very much. Cheers. Take it easy. <laughs>